2024 is shaping up to be a rather shocking year. Now, I'm not going to lean into the shocking and stunning, but what I am here is to uh, prevent or present some data, rather, some data and numbers and facts and figures. So I want to start off this with uh, just this number that I saw. There have been 42,000 tech layoffs so far in America in 2024, and it's only just March 1st at the date of recording. So in two months, we've had 42,000 layoffs. Now, somewhere in the numbers, I saw that there was something like 190,000 jobs lost last year uh, in the tech space. And so the question is like, okay, well, why is this happening? One of the things that, that companies have said, oh, well, we, we accidentally hired too many people during the pandemic. And that may or may not be true. There's a lot of criticism of remote work and those sorts of things. And of course, there was also like, you know, Pay, payroll protection programs. So maybe they deliberately overhired to get some government funding and now they're laying people off. But as I have been talking about for a long time, it's primarily due to AI. So headcount reduction is the name of the game. Humans are expensive to employ. It takes six months for a human uh, employee to come up to speed. Um, they require benefits. They might sue you. Uh, and if you do lay them off, then there's all sorts of requirements um, in terms of giving them benefits and severance and those sorts of things. And so the best employee is no employee. And this is borrowing from Elon Musk's uh, the best part is no part principle. And so what we're going to see is we're entering into a new era of employment and labor markets where the best employee is no employee. So you might have heard uh, Sam Altman, I think it was a tweet or an interview where he said that he anticipates in the next few years, you're going to see the first billion dollar unicorn company with no employees and only a, you know, a founder or a co-founder, uh, basically a pair of guys or one guy making all the software and all the platforms just with AI. Now, the flip side of that is no employees. And so some people on, uh, out on the internet are saying, you know, CEOs are the first to go, CEOs are the last to go. I think it's going to be a little bit of both. In many cases, AI can probably run companies better than CEOs, uh, certainly than some human CEOs that I've known in my time. Um, but in other cases, CEOs are going to be the only employee, and it's going to be the sole proprietor. And so this article from Fortune talks about how AI, uh, AI is like corporate ozempic. It trims the fat, and you keep the fact that you're using it a secret. Now, this is something that I've been saying as well for a while, so I'm good to see that there's someone who's more of a market insider and more of a uh, kind of an expert in the field. And so people have asked me, like, what's what's the paradigm here? What's the trend? And if you remember during the pandemic and in even before during the 2008 recession, there's kind of this pattern that happens, and it's deny, deny, deny. So first you deny that anything is happening, and then it's downplay, downplay, downplay. You say it's not that bad. And then once people say, okay, it is happening, it is that bad, you say distract, 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 you do, you use misdirection, and then finally you say, well, it's here to say, and maybe it's actually a good thing. And so there's this kind of four-phase cycle that happens whenever there's any uh, major change out there. And this stuff has been well-documented. Um, you know, Edward Bernays, the, the, the godfather of, uh, of propaganda, he started this back in, what, the 30s? He was the, the, ne the nephew of, um, of uh, Sigmund Freud. And then, of course, Noam Chomsky and others have written extensively about this, um, Necessary Illusions and Manufacturing Consent. Um, so this is, this is the way the game is played. And like it, it's rather formulaic. Um, and so if you, if you ever watch like a politician or a CEO or whatever, when someone asks them about AI layoffs and they just change the subject, that's the like, you know, smoke and mirrors, like pay no attention to the man behind the curtains. So AI is coming. AI is causing layoffs. It's causing headcount reduction. Now, in many cases, it's not necessarily going to be AI is going to come and do your job specifically. It's going to do parts of your job. It's going to streamline and operationalize it. And so a really good example of this was the replacement of telephone operators. It wasn't that we needed a robot to come and do the exact job of a telephone operator. It was actually a bunch of technologies that just subverted the, even the need for a telephone operator. And so what we're seeing out there in the job space is that the need for your job just goes away and you get the legs cut out from underneath you because all the functions of your job are either completely supplanted by new platforms or new services that the company can sign up for. So that's really what's happening, and that's what's coming down the pipeline. And the numbers are starting to back it up.
Now, many of you will ask, okay, so what do we do about this? I have been a big, I've been beating the drum on post-labor economics, which is basically we need to come up with not just, not just a, an evolution of the current paradigms because this uh, replacement of labor is fundamentally paradigm breaking. Uh, and what I mean by that is the current paradigm basically says you need to have a job. The entire economy runs on consumer demand and labor markets and free market theory about, you know, capital goods and services and then consumers and workplaces and those sorts of things. But if we are all going to be losing our jobs, or even if most people lose their jobs, even if only we end up with 30% unemployment, the current paradigm cannot bear that. So if we end up anywhere between 20% and 80% or 100% unemployment, the current paradigm fails. Now, this article popped up, and I don't know how much how much legs this has um, because it's kind of a it's kind of a backwater, you know, a smaller periodical. But it was really kind of alarming when I saw this come across my radar. The billion the billionaire fueled lobbying group behind the state bills to ban basic income experiments. So there are some activist billionaires out there, basically wanting to say, "Hey, we don't want anyone to even try UBI experiments." And one of the reasons that they give is basically that if you if you do this, you disincentivize work. Uh, you disincentivize uh, people from innovating, from taking you know entrepreneurial leaps, and you also uh, upend the labor market. Now that is all true. If you give people enough money to be comfortable, you know some I think someone said like was universal generous income or whatever, like UGI is kind of what some people are talking about. If you remove the need for people to work. Yes, a lot of people will check out of the out of the economy permanently except for their consumer demand. Consumer demand will always drive the economy. I talked about this in several other videos where I talked about all humans have basic needs. Food, housing, clothing, entertainment, and the desire our intrinsic desire for those needs can still run the economy. Consumer demand is re is relatively permanent. However, this is an example of the old paradigm trying to reassert itself. This is something that I've predicted where the old guard will double down on the status quo and do everything that they can to maintain the current status quo at all costs, including inflicting pain on a lot of people because, again, billionaires and politicians are insulated from the lived experience of people having to work two and three jobs in order to make ends meet. Now, speaking of billionaires, you might have heard that Mark Zuckerberg has a $100 million compound on Hawaii, and actually, reading this article, given the land cost, the total cost of his compound is expected to be somewhere north of $270 million, but it also includes a 5,000-square-foot bunker complete with uh, food supplies and, and internal power. So why is one of the world's richest tech billionaires who's leading the charge of artificial general intelligence building a bunker on an island in the middle of the, of the Pacific. Now, it could just be a boyhood fantasy. Um, it could be that he's hedging his bets, but it is a little bit, um, let's just say, unsettling. And he's also not the only uh, billionaire prepper. Uh, Sam Altman has, has a prepper ranch somewhere in the Midwest, I think, where he's got stockpiles of guns um, and food and ammo. Uh, I'm sure Elon Musk has a bailout strategy as well. Uh, but anyway, so I wanted to point this out uh, before winding down this video. So on the topic of Mark Zuckerberg and Meta and Facebook and all that, I did mention that uh, Mark Zuckerberg is talking about how AGI is going to be open source. And so this is something that I have advocated for a lot, is that AGI should be open source. And in fact, I ran a poll uh, just yesterday where most of you are in agreement that AGI, or maybe it was a few days ago. Anyways, AGI should be open source. And Mark Zuckerberg actually uh, explained on this call, I actually listened to some of it, where he explained in, in very clear terms that they're not an AI provider, not in the same way that OpenAI and Microsoft and Google are, are positioning them, themselves to be, but rather AI is just part of their portfolio of products. So whether it's the metaverse or whatever else, uh, or gaming, uh, you know, those sorts of things, AI is just going to augment the products that they have, and so they they don't really care. AI is just a utility, and open source AI will make that cheaper for them, and, and it will also make their products better and safer. That's of course what he's arguing. Now, as a tech billionaire, you know, take it with a grain of salt as to what his actual motives are. But he does have some good points, and I do happen to agree with at least the words that he's saying, if not you know whatever hidden agendas that he has, is that open source is structurally one of the biggest things that we can do to ensure that AI is one, democratically accessible, 
and also safe because then it can be scrutinized by everyone. And it's not just the models that should be open source. It's also the data sets used to train these models should also be open source. Now, obviously, in the paradigm that we have today where there's private property and property rights, there will always be some closed source and there will probably also always be some open source. So the landscape is going to be a hybrid landscape of a little bit of both. Now, what's the optimal? I don't know what the optimal is. And of course, as some people will say, well, you wouldn't open source the plans to make nuclear weapons. You wouldn't open source the plans to make a global plague. That is also true. But as we stage the release of these AI technologies, you can also use fire to fight fire. And so what I mean by that is you are going to have AGI-enabled firewalls. We're going to have AGI-enabled data center security. We're going to have AGI-enabled whatever, you know, antivirus. And so it's going to be a natural escalation in the technology space. But this is nothing new. I've talked to some cybersecurity experts, both in my Patreon and in other places, um, and they say, like, yeah, it's going to change some things. It's not going to change others. The fundamental – so one one interesting thing that I learned is that, yes, AI can help write viruses, but the fundamental science around computer viruses won't – they don't really expect it to change that much, at least not yet. Of course, time will tell. It could be that we learn something new, especially with you know QSTAR and quantum computing and that sort of thing. But in the meantime – It is good that there is at least one tech billionaire who is on the side of open source. And I hope that there are more that will join in terms of this conversation, because if you remember last year, all of the all of the congressional hearings where, you know, Mark Zuckerberg and Sam Altman and others were dragged in front of Congress. Mark Zuckerberg was the only one who said, like, open source is the way, whether it was IBM or Microsoft or Google. They're just like, no, we want to keep it closed source. But again, this has to do with profit motive. Meta is not an AI company. Google, Microsoft, and OpenAI, and IBM, they are kind of more of the raw compute uh, place. And you also see Microsoft and NVIDIA hedging their bets with open source models uh, anyways. So, I mean, a lot of these companies, they're they're kind of playing the field and seeing where it's going to go. Anyways, I thought this was interesting information, and there's a little bit of data to kind of back up some of the stuff that I've been saying. So, thanks for watching. I hope you got a lot out of this. Uh, Yeah, let me know what you think in the comments. Cheers.